Hi, this is Natalie. Thank you for listening to Crossroads Church, where we are bringing a real God to real people. I believe you'll be inspired by today's message. Good morning, Crossroads. Good morning. Love you guys. Y'all look beautiful this morning. My name is Marcus. In case you don't know, I'm the lead pastor here. Pastor Joel, our teaching pastor, is actually in Guatemala. We saw him earlier. Uh, we didn't see him, but he said, hey, I'm, I'm watching you guys online right now. So anyways, and there's other folks down in Seattle area that are actually hosting our online experience. So let's just say good morning to all of those guys. If you guys are ever in the area, in the Seguin area, make sure and come by. Uh, we have services at 9, 10, and 11. This morning, we are going to continue our series on the Summer of Joy. We're looking at the book of Philippians. We're trying to mine out, just going verse by verse, mining out different scriptures, different truths from scripture that we can apply and implement in our lives. So the title of this morning's message is, Where is Timothy? Where is Timothy or Tiffany? No, where is Timothy? And we'll take a look at that. Several years ago, when Natalie and I were uh, younger in ministry, in our early, in our mid-20s, actually, uh, we, we went to church, we came home, we were at the house uh, making lunch, getting ready for lunch, and uh, as we were gonna, about to sit down at the table, we get a phone call from our, um, at, at that time, our children's pastors, uh, David and Lisa Brown. Actually, they they're actually helped us start the uh, Crossroads Church 17 years ago, and they come back full circle, and they were here at our first service. They're actually a part of what's happening here at, at, in the life of, our, of the ministry here. But we get a call from Lisa, and uh, Natty answers. She goes, hey, did you forget something? He goes, no, I don't, I don't think so. He goes, well, did you forget someone, like your youngest daughter, Bianca Avalos? Because she's right here. But don't worry, because we'll, we got her, and we'll take her home to you. We're like, oh, my God. And uh, this poor girl got traumatized. And Bianca is that little one right here. You know, she was, and she actually texted me after she heard the message. She goes, Dad, you remember the time you also uh, left me at Johnny Carino's? I'm like, oh, my gosh. And poor, <laughs> poor parents, we were horrible. <laughs> Anyways... <laughs> My point is this, is that sometimes in the busyness of our lives, sometimes as we're just going for it, we forget about some of the most important things that should be a part of our lives, like family, like our kids, maybe like holistic health or pay, learning how to pace yourself. Some of these things just slip by us and we're not careful, man, we're going to pay the price. And in this morning's uh, passage that we're taking a look at in Philippians, the second chapter, I was reminded by the Apostle Paul, a key component in our lives as a follower of Jesus, that if we forget this idea that we're looking at this morning, if we forget it or we don't handle it correctly, uh, we could forfeit or we could come up short in our life mission and our calling. We could come up short in our spiritual, for sure, in our spiritual legacy and our future. Because how many of you guys know that what you're doing today impacts your tomorrow and the generation that goes after you? And if we don't pay attention to this idea that we're looking at, um, having a successor to uphold the values and, and the freedoms that you have, that you've learned to fight so hard for while you're here on this earth, that you tried to establish in your kids, it'll be lost immediately. Uh, Ronald Reagan has this awesome quote. He goes, freedom is fragile. It's a fragile thing, and it's never more than one generation away from extinction. All it takes is one generation of not paying attention, and all, that was, all the work that was done to, to uphold those standards, all of a sudden it's all lost. Speaking of spiritual legacy, Joshua, who was a successor of Moses, while Joshua was in the leadership role, it says that all the people worshiped God. They, 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 they lifted him on high. They worshiped and exalted him. But as soon as he died, uh, a generation later, all of them forgot about who their God was. Actually, in Judges, the second chapter, it says, the people worship God throughout the lifetime of Joshua. Then he dies, the servant of God, at 110 years old. Then another generation grew up that didn't know anything of God or the work that he had done for Israel. The people of Israel did evil in God's sight. They served Baal gods. They deserted God, the God of their parents who had led them out of Egypt. Isn't that sad? But that happens all the time. Think about it. We're talking about the parents that physically saw and interacted, you know, and saw the, the cloud by day and the fire by night, all that that was empowered to those kids all of a sudden, one generation away, they forget about all that and they begin to serve Baal gods. Now, we're admonished in scripture. Uh, we are commanded to empower the next generation. In 2 Timothy, the second chapter, it says, you have heard me teach the things 
that have been confirmed by many reliable witnesses. Now teach these truths to other trustworthy people who will be able to pass them on to others. It's important for us. So based upon your values, your current lifestyle, what kind of a spiritual legacy are we leaving? What kind of a spiritual legacy are we leaving to our kids and our grandkids? As a matter of fact, let me say it this way. How would they fill in this blank right here? The most important thing to my dad is blank. The most important thing to my mom or my, my grandparents that I see, well, how would, how would those kids see that? What would they put in there? Would they say, well, the most important is Christ, it's going to church, wealth, working hard, making things work. I don't know, all I see is mom trying to find out another guy who can provide for our family. What are they seeing? What are we empower? What are we leaving behind? We're leaving something behind. All of us are, whether we like it or not. Drugs, partying, what are they watching you pay attention to? Is a great question. And I know this about every single one of us. We all desire better for our family. We all desire better for a future generation. We want something that outlasts us, something that's transferable. We desire something that they can hold fast to, something stronger, something deeper, something that we can be proud of saying, yeah, that's my grandkid right there. He's doing well. You know, he learned that from his, from my, you know, from his, from her, from their grandmother or whatever it is. Oh, speaking of the little girl, Bianca, that probably could have or should have gotten traumatized because we constantly left her behind somewhere. <laughs> she turned out to be okay. Okay, she's part of the ministry here. She's part of, of church here. And actually, I was thinking about what kind of, um, what would she put in that blank? And actually, Bianca wrote a book about it. And I happened to find it. Now I wanted to share it with you this morning. It goes, My Daddy is the name of the book. <laughs> Isn't that cute? There I am with curly hair and a mustache and a tie. I used to wear ties all the time. Uh, that was one of the things I asked, Lord, whenever we start this church, I don't want to wear a tie ever again. And so, but he goes, this book is dedicated to dad by Bianca Avalos. Once there was a brother named Marcus Avalos. They called him Brother Marcus. He laid hands on people and God would heal them. He goes, I thought he was a good rev. <laughs> I am his daughter, Bianca Avalos, and I have two more sisters and no brothers. My daddy preached to prisons and churches. And there I am behind bars somewhere. God loves you. <laughs> He preached a lot. He read his Bible a candidly, maybe occasionally. I don't know what that means. He prays a lot too. I love my daddy. There I am again, curly hair. Because my daddy uh, teaches me how to play softball. I can hit really good. I usually play second base. My daddy plays the drums at my church at that time. It was Tree of Life uh, a Church there in New Braunfels Fellowship. He goes, there's the drums, a 15-piece drum kit. He goes, this is a picture of all of our band. There's Neil Tipton. I know all these guys. I know exactly what she was talking about. He goes, I think, I think my dad is the best dad in all the world. I concur. Best dad in the world award. He goes, I love my dad. He changed my life a lot. I can't even name all of them, but here are some. There's volumes of stuff that she couldn't put in there. One softball was most important because that's all we did. We played softball a lot. And then he goes on. He goes, and getting me saved. My dad is the best. The end. Isn't that powerful? What kind of a storybook would your child write? It's like, oh, Lord, please don't even think about that. I don't know what it is, but you would know. So in Philippians, the second chapter, we're going to take a look at the Apostle Paul in the next passage that we're looking at. And we're looking at verses 19 through 24. Paul is um, instructing us and he's coaching us on some things. He goes, I'm trusting in the Lord Jesus that I may send Timothy to you so I can be refreshed when I find out how you're doing. Timothy is like no other. He carries the same passion for your welfare that I carry in my heart. For it seems as though everyone else is busy seeking what's best for themselves instead of the things that are most important to the Lord Jesus Christ. You already know about the excellent reputation since he has served alongside me as a loyal son in the work of the ministry. After I see what's transpired with me, he's the one that I will send to you to bless you. And I'm trusting in my Lord to return to you in due time. Paul never got to return because he wound up getting martyred. And just a reminder for those who have not been here uh, when we started the series, the Apostle Paul, when he was penning these words, he was confined to a prison cell. But how many guys know that the Word of God will never be confined? The Word of God will never be restrained. And when poor leaders are trying to pursue the things of God, but they're weak leaders and, and adversity strikes, guess what? 
they faint in the middle of adversity. But individuals who are strong, who have a passion to pursue and fulfill all that God has for them, when they face adversity, they strike adversity. And they make sure, they figure out a way to make sure that the gospel keeps on going forth because that's the mandate, that's the mission, that's why they're on here on this earth for, to make sure that the next generation understands who our father really is. And Paul did that. How did Paul advance the gospel even though he was confined to a prison cell? You know how he did that? He did that by empowering a son in the faith, a guy by the name of Timothy. And how are we as a church, as Crossroads Church, going to advance this gospel message to the next generation to secure our spiritual legacy so that when whoever's pastoring this church, you know, dies or whatever, or is too old to pastor, uh, how do we make sure that it just continues to, to, to move forward and advance the gospel message in our community? Well, here's how we do it, by serving this generation well and also raising up young Timothys. So where is Timothy? Where is Timothy in our lives. Turn to your neighbor and say, have you found Timothy yet? Have you found Timothy yet? Yes. <laughs> this morning, I want to focus for a few moments on the qualities of becoming a Timothy, a, a son in the faith, a carrier of faith to the next generation. What are some of the attributes? Granted, there's a whole lot to say about mentorship, and the Apostle Paul is an amazing mentor, and there's some great truths regarding that. But what does it take to become a Timothy? What, is it, what qualifies me to become a Timothy? And in order for me to effectively set this up, I have to talk to you about the Apostle Paul and what I call point leadership. Point leadership is the guy that, you know, when God wants to transform a, a city or a community or, or a business or whatever, God always has to, he needs a willing vessel, male or female, one who's available, one who's willing to go long and, and, and just pursue all that, that he's calling him to do. He has to raise an individual, and then he parts vision to that individual. Hey, this is what it should be. This is where it's at now. I need you to take me there. And, 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 and the individual that's getting this vision, it's like it's always too big. It's too large for one individual. It's too expensive for one individual. There's never enough money. There's never enough things to do. We need someone. It takes an army of committed followers to fulfill the things that God wants to fulfill when he's transforming big and great things. Jesus never let them go out by themselves. He always sent them out two by two. He had his 12. Those 12 were broken down into three. Even the three now were broken down into one. And he's, he's, he's doing the same thing with us. And on that path, any leader who's on the path to fulfill the mission that God has called him to, every point leader will always face opposition and he will always need other individuals to help them, to spur them on, to fulfill the thing that God has put in his heart to do. And so Paul needs, right now, you know, he, he, he had certain needs. You know, he was in prison, he was confined. I was looking at 2 Timothy, the second chapter. This is when he's facing the second imprisonment. And this is right before he died. And I peeked into that window to see some of the needs that the Apostle Paul had. And it goes something like, he goes, Timothy, again, he's addressing his loyal son in the faith. He goes, be diligent to come to me quickly, for Demas has forsaken me. How many of you guys know that when you're pursuing the things of God, people will betray you, people will forsake you. It's not all high and mighty. It's like, hey, I want to be a pastor. No, you don't. You're going to die. <laughs> you know, it's, it's not an application. People will forsake you. People will betray you. There's so much going on constantly. And I'm not saying, oh, poor me. I'm just saying that only, uh, only an individual who's graced by the Spirit of God can sustain long-term health doing these roles. Look at all the apostles. Look at all the disciples. They all got martyred. You want to be a pastor? Look for martyrdom. Something's going to happen. Timothy, be diligent to come to me. Demas has forsaken me. Heaven loved the present world. It's like, man, I just poured everything into you. Now you're going back. What's wrong with you? And has departed for Thessalonica. Crescens for Galatia. Titus for Dalmatia. They were doing ministry with you. All of a sudden, they, they're moving. They're off. All you, you find yourself, you know, they say it's lonely at the top. Sometimes they go through all kinds of stuff. Only Luke is with me now. Get Mark and bring him with you. He's useful for me for ministry. And Tychicus, I've sent to Ephesus. Bring the cloak. Here's the needs. Hey, I need you to Timothy. Whenever you come, bring the cloak that I left at Carpus and Troas when you come. And the books, especially those parchments. Think about Paul's needs. He goes, Timothy, I need you to come quickly. 
I need you, my brother. He goes, oh, and don't forget that cloak. He goes, I know it doesn't mean anything to you, but that cloak means a lot to me. I need you to get it. One, it's kept me warm through all these, all these winter months, uh, all the snow that comes. It, it, it's been with me since I started this journey as a follower of Christ, as a follower of the way. It might have been there when, 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 when Jesus converted him on the road to Damascus. It's kept my body warm over and over. Yes, it's, it's tattered and it's frayed and it's dusty from all the, the roads that were traveled on them. Yes, it probably stinks because it's been there on the shores of Galilee and, and, and it's full of salt water. And, and also it's stained. It's stained crimson red with blood, my own blood, when they were beating me there at Lystra when they were persecuting me and putting me up for death. This cloak, Timothy, is not only going to keep me warm, but it's going to remind me of my calling. It's going to remind me of why and what I'm committed to. Bring my cloak. And don't you forget those parchments, the collection of books. I need these books, especially those parchments. Because in moments like this, it brings me hope when I get discouraged. In moments like this, I can look to the Psalms of David and get comforted how David was comforted. When I need some guidance and I need some wisdom, I can go to the Proverbs and get some and glean some wisdom so I can make the next right decision. And most of all, when I'm downcast, I can look at the prophets' pens and the words that they wrote and it gives me strength. Please don't forget about those things. My life right now is being threatened, but my future is secure because I read these parchments and I need them. I need the cloak, I need the collection of books, but most of all, I need connection. I need you, Timothy, more than anything. You're my brother. I need you, my loyal friend, my son in the faith. Listen, I can totally identify with the Apostle Paul. Man, I need my Bible. I need my backpack, wherever it is. And most of all, I need my brothers. I need my brothers and sisters in the faith because I know that I can't do this without. I need my Timothys and my Tiffany's or Timotheus or whatever you want to call it. I need, we need each other. Why was Timothy sought after? What was inside of him that made him such an asset to Paul's ministry? Thank you for asking. So we're going to look at that. The qualities of a Timothy. One, trustworthy. This is just straight from that scripture, from that passage. I'm trusting in our Lord. What? I'm trusting in the Lord Jesus that I may send Timothy to you so that I can be refreshed when I find out how you're doing. He's trustworthy. In other words, man, if I give this guy a task, I know that he's going to come. I know he's going to fulfill it. He's a make it happen kind of a guy. Number two, he's like no other. He stands out. There's something about them. There's something special about this guy that says that he was like no other. In other words, you can't, you ever notice people whenever you're around them, it's like, man, there's something special about that guy. Sometimes, most of the time, they don't even see that in and of themselves, but we're, we're able to see it. We're able to get a glimpse of the calling or the hand of God that's upon them. And we're also being, should be responsible to try to draw that out and help them to see it and understand that and fulfill and spur them on to do great and mighty things. He stands out. And then the third thing is this. He goes, he carries Paul's passion and caring heart. He's an extension of the mentor that's mentoring him. You know, you can't teach that. You can't teach that. It can't be taught. It has to be caught. Uh, how, do you, how, do you, how do you catch it? You've got to spend time with him. You've got to stay close to him. You've got to ask questions. You've got to watch him. You know, when my pastor, uh, Don, when I was in New Braunfels, um, he would say, hey, he, every now and then he would call me up. He goes, hey, get ready. It's like, where are we going? He goes, just get ready and bring a notebook. I'm like, okay, just take notes. I'm like, okay. So I didn't realize that he was coaching me. He was grooming me for something that I didn't even see in myself. And we would go around, we'd go to a funeral, we'd go to a hospital, and, and he, he would look at me, he goes, take notes. I'm like, okay, what, what am I going to take? What is he saying? Was, I don't know what I was doing. But then he would just drop me off. Every now and then he would do it again. He was just coaching me. He goes, and so I got a hold of that. You know, right before I came from out of Bible school, I, had a, I was at a crossroads. I could either stay there in Broken Arrow, Oklahoma, and submit myself under the leadership there, which was an amazing, amazing leader, uh, Joe Dunnick, who's a missions director there. And I could sit there and serve under him because I was under his ministry while I was up there in Bible school. Or I could come back home to New Braunfels and uh, submit myself under the leadership of my local church, 
which was Tree of Life and under Don Duncan. And he was an older gentleman. He was, went to Vietnam. He had five tours in Vietnam. Lost many, many of his men. But he was the most holiest man I've ever met, even to this day, on the face of this earth. He was a man who loved to pray. He was a man who loved people. As a matter of fact, he loved them so much that that's the reason why he died. He had an explosive, his heart exploded while he was in the pulpit. And then he wound up dying in front of us. And so I was like, do I go to this guy? No, I wanted to submit myself under this guy. And so I just went, he was in like, people say that I have a heart of what Don used to have. And I never saw that. But you can't help it. Whenever you're around someone so much, it's just, it just, it just, it happens to grow on you, right? And so I love that about him. So Paul, or Timothy, he had Paul's passion and caring heart. Number four, says he wasn't self-seeking. He wasn't self-promoting. He was more Christ-centric. It says it seems as though everyone else is busy seeking what's best for themselves instead of the things that are most important to our Lord Jesus Christ. They're self-promoting or they're just using the, 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 the moment, the, the position that they're given to promote themselves. Or they use it as a stepping stone for something that they're thinking about in their future. And that's not what Paul was seeing in Timothy. He's not self, self, or self-promoting. That's why I love one of our core values at Crossroads. Jesus, not us. We're not here to promote ourselves. We're not here to promote our church. We're here to promote Christ, Jesus, not us. And he was Christ-centric. In other words, the filter that he used to make decisions in his life went something like this. If I engage in this activity in my life, is this going to enhance the gospel or is this going to cause people to question the gospel? It's the filter. And some folks don't recognize that that's an important role in our lives as well. People look at, look at your life and though they might capture things that you believe, but they're more going to see how you behave more than anything else. So it does. Sometimes it, 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 it behooves us to, to have self-restraint and not involve ourselves in certain activities that will only hinder the gospel message in the future. Does that make sense? He was Christ-centric. He was always thinking about the gospel. The six had a reputation of an excellent servant and loyal son, not like a taskmaster and selfish hireling. Because you already know about his excellent reputation since he has served alongside me as a loyal son in the work of ministry. This reputation went before him. And then the last thing, he was faithful. And we can glean so many more attributes from Timothy. But we find this when he was there at uh, the Corinthian church. Then the Corinthian church was crazy. I mean, they were having orgies. They were doing all kinds of stuff. And who, did, who could Paul entrust to go down there and speak to them? Timothy, a loyal son in the faith. For this reason, I've sent Timothy to you, who's my beloved and faithful son in the Lord. He'll remind you of my ways. He'll provoke you. He'll encourage you to do that. Faithfulness is a very, very important key in our life as a follower of Jesus. The more faithful you are, the more value you have for the kingdom. But the less faithful, your level of faithfulness determines your value of service. The less faithful you are, we can't count on people. You know, Greg Popovich needs to know who's going to show up and who's on his bench. The Cowboys need... I ain't going to talk about the Cowboys. Forget it. <laughs> but it's important for us to remain faithful. Helen Keller has a beautiful quote. It goes something like this. I long to accomplish great noble tasks, but it's my chief duty to accomplish small tasks as if though they were great and noble. Remain faithful. So once again, where's Timothy at? You know where I believe he is? He's right here in this room. He's right here. I'm looking at him face to face. I'm looking at him every Sunday. And I am so proud to be a pastor here in this community. Because if I'm gone, I guarantee you, you guys will not let this church fall. And the next pastor that comes, that's what we have to do. We have to continue to raise Timothy's. So as your take home today, I'm going to give you the top three Timothy opportunities to get involved in in the next few weeks. One, VBS. We've never had a VBS here at the church. We've always just kind of uh, um, spread our, our, we saw what was effective already, and we would just send people over there. But uh, Abby, our new children's director, which, by the way, is doing an, an amazing, amazing job here. Yeah. She said, can we do a VBS? I'm like, let's go. Let's do it. 
because you're going to have to do this, you're going to have to do that. She goes, I'll, I'll take care of it. The gospel to the kids in Seguin. She needs some help. Just sign up. She'll tell you what to do. Believe me, she will tell you what to do. And uh, she's not scared about it. Why? Because her passion is to see as many kids as possible come to Jesus. Another opportunity is in the fall, we start grow groups again. And man, it's so important for us to be involved in some kind of a community. Just one or two other people just to do life with, to rally around the word of God, to worship God, to be there when stuff happens. You know, when, when tragedy strikes, two things are a determining factor of whether you'll succeed and move forward or not. One is your belief system, the filter of how you believe, and two is the people you're hanging around with. I encourage you to get a hold of it, uh, of a small group that's going to be coming up. But we need host homes. We also need host leaders. We will train you. We will empower. It's not difficult at all. And it's not like you're going to have your host, your, your house, you know, infiltrated or people aren't meeting all the time or people, you know, just going to be, they're going to give you the, you're going to give them the key to your house. And that's not going to happen. You, you might meet twice a month, but we're going to rally around the word of God. It's very, very easy. And if you're here new to Crossroads Church and you don't know what to do next, let me encourage you to go to CC Life, which will start, I think, in August. And that's where my wife, Natalie, will come and kind of share the philosophy of our ministry and the heartbeat of why we do what we do, I encourage you to partner with us. And then she'll also give you an assessment so that you can understand your gifts and then try to give you an opportunity to use those gifts while you're serving here among this family we call Crossroads Church. And please, by all means, don't talk yourself out of it. Don't say, I don't do VBS. I don't do groups. I don't do, I just want to do church. That's it. No, 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 no. You've got three seconds to make decisions. You know, aren't you glad Jesus never said, hey, I don't do crosses. Yeah. Or Mary said, I don't do virgin births. Amen. Or David say, hey, I don't do giants. Amen. Or Noah says, I don't do arcs. <laughs> aren't you glad that my wife said, hey, Marcus, I don't do CE. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Amen. I'm so thankful. Listen, Jesus came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for all. Amen. And that's what we're all about here. So, Father, you're so good to us. We're so thankful for your goodness. We thank you for the word of God. We thank you, Lord God, that you can challenge our hearts to, to be what you've called us to be, just like Paul empowered Timothy. Lord God, I pray that people are open to be instructed to understand their role, to find that place so that they can bear fruit and leave a legacy worth fighting for. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen. Lord bless you. You guys have a wonderful, wonderful Sunday. We'll see you next Sunday. If you are ever in the Seguin area, come visit us on Sunday mornings at 9 or 11 a.m. Or you can just download our app and receive our weekly messages right to your phone. Just text CC Seguin to 77977 and click on the link that you receive. May the remainder of your week be enriched with God's favor and blessings.